My name is Joe Lauder. I'm Dean of Economic Community Services at Etiwama Community College. Today I'm going to be talking about preparing students for a 21st century economy. I'm usually talking to educators. Um, that's what usually who I'm giving this presentation to, talking about the importance of how the economy is going to be changing and um, some of those changes and what's going to occur. Every day I work on what's called bridging the skills gap. The skills gap is, um, well, I have a definition for it right here. Overwhelming disparity between what employers need to fill important jobs and the skill sets that today's pool of candidates currently possess. If you look on, there's an app for Mississippi Jobs, uh, Mississippi Works. Um, as of last week, it was up to 46,000 jobs that we have available in Mississippi. The problem is, is we don't have the skills needed to fill those jobs. There's candidates on the low end and maybe even some of the high end, but not the ones where they're, where they're really needed. So what we're trying to do to fill the middle skills gap is pretty important because it's going to keep growing. A Deloitte study found by 2025 that will grow to almost five, 2 million in America. 56% of respondents found that the hard, middle skill jobs are very hard to fill and that those were most um, availability was toughest to fill in manufacturing at 47% and healthcare at 35%. So what that means is there are, um, let me have a slide on that too. Well, what that means is there are people who have advanced degrees, a bachelor's or above, uh, that are high skill, and there's people who maybe just have a high school diploma, low skill, the middle skill is two year degree or less. So a credential certification or an associate's degree. Those are the jobs that a lot of employers are looking to fill across the nation, especially in Mississippi right now. That's what I mean by middle skills gap. Why is there a skills gap? Uh, there's a couple of reasons. One is baby boomers. There's a ton retiring right now. I work with companies who track this. I have a company that knows 10 years out what their employees' retirement plans are and how they're going to need to put people up and bring them up in those positions and put training programs together. That's leaving the gap as they leave the workforce. The second one is advances in technology and automation. And the second half of my presentation will cover that. Right now, I'm talking about our issues now, day to day, what we in workforce at MLP College have to help with. And then we'll move into the future. This is today. It's even going to get worse as we're moving forward. Uh, perception of industry. Um, for manufacturing especially, this is not as big of an issue for healthcare, but in manufacturing specifically, 65% will not encourage their kids to pursue a career in it. 45% believe it offers limited advancement, 66% thinks it's not stable enough. However, in a similar survey, 90% of Americans agree that manufacturing is important to the economy, and they're right, it contributes over two trillion to the US economy every year. It is a wealth creator for communities and people who live in those communities because you make something from nothing and sell it out and it brings money into the community. So it absolutely is important. I have a video here that kind of talks about it. Education is core to our economy. But in order to guide our educational systems and maximize future income, we must understand the misalignment between education and our workforce. In my pursuit of higher education, I have earned two bachelor's degrees, two master's degrees, and I'm working on a PhD. In total, this has cost me over $150,000. I've done all this because I believe formal education is important. Part of this belief came from seeing charts like this, presenting a correlation between higher degrees and higher income, showing on average that a person with a college degree earns far more money than the average person without a high school diploma. This perceived higher earnings for having a four-year degree has fueled a college for all philosophy, causing educators and parents to encourage going to the university, any university, to major in anything in pursuit of future job security, social mobility, and financial prosperity. This philosophy has increased college enrollment, resulting in 66% of high school graduates in this country enrolling in higher education right after high school. That's two out of three. Initially, they are deemed the successful ones, but what you won't see advertised is the reality that most drop out, and only a quarter of those that enroll will finish a bachelor's degree. Only after these few graduate do many of them start exploring careers. It is here that they discover 
that their degree may not have prepared them for the world of work. You may be well educated, but not every degree is direct preparation for employment. This misalignment between degrees and job skills causes half of university graduates to be underemployed in what are called gray-collar jobs, taking positions that do not require the education they have received at a cost that is more than they can afford. Conventional wisdom suggests that a university degree guarantees a higher salary, but with rising education costs, a shrinking job market, and the oversaturation of some academic majors in the workforce, this old advice is now a myth for a majority of students. The economy and the world have dramatically changed. Over the last three generations, we've gone from 13% of the population stepping into a college classroom to 60% attending some form of higher education. In 1960, when taking into account all jobs in the American economy, 20% required a four-year degree or higher, 20% were technical jobs requiring skilled training, and 60% were classified as unskilled. But what's the right percentage to meet the labor market demand for tomorrow? In 2018, Harvard University predicts only 33% of all jobs will require a four-year degree or more, while the overwhelming majority will be middle-skilled jobs requiring technical skills and training at the credential or associate degree level. A four-year degree may have many benefits, but think about the people you know who, from an economic perspective, inefficiently spent time and money to get a degree that perhaps they didn't really need for the career they are in. The true ratio of jobs in our economy is one, two, seven. For every occupation that requires a master's degree or more, two professional jobs require a university degree, and there are over half a dozen jobs requiring a one-year certificate or two-year degree. And each of these technicians are in very high-skilled areas that are in great demand. This ratio is fundamental to all industries. It was the same in 1950, the same in 1990, and will be the same in 2030. The hope for encouraging university education is that as the number of university trained workers increases, the demand for their services in the workplace will increase as well. Unfortunately, this is not so. The whole pie may get bigger as the labor force and the economy grows, but the ratio will not change. The reality is, there will not be more professional jobs available within the labor market and some professional jobs have been replaced by technology or are being outsourced. Well-intentioned attempts to send more and more students straight to the university will not change the types of jobs that dominate our economy, nor will a college-for-all mentality mask these labor market realities. The college-for-all rhetoric that has been so much a part of the current education reform movement is often interpreted as university-for-all. This message needs to be significantly broadened to a post-high school credential-for-all. Students at various educational levels have left school without employable skills, setting up our children for failure, costing them and taxpayers millions. All while the labor market is desperate for highly trained, skilled technicians. So how do you position yourself for high-wage, in-demand jobs? Let's say you were considering a career as either an electrician or a business manager. You would find that the average annual income for electricians is 51000 only about half of the 105,000 average wage for management occupations. So at first glance, it looks as if getting a bachelor's degree in business is a no-brainer. But adding skills and ability into the picture adds a whole new dynamic. What if you have the potential to become an excellent electrician, but lack the skills and ability to be an excellent manager? Then you should be looking at projected incomes towards the bottom of the pay scale for managers and towards the top for electricians. You would then discover that electricians near the top of the pay scale make around 86000 far higher than the income of a manager near the bottom of the pay scale at 52000 Now this is just one example, but the concept is true throughout all industries. The claim that you will make more money with an increased amount of education is not necessarily inaccurate, it's just incomplete. That advice is based just on the averages, but no one is perfectly average. Everyone has unique skills, talents, and interests. In fact, the income for the top individuals in a wide variety of skilled jobs that require an industry credential or two-year degree is far higher than the average income for many occupations that require a four-year degree. Nationally, associate degree earners range between 27,000 and 68,000 while bachelor's recipients earn between 34000 and 97000 But this data only accounts for the 25th to the 75th percentile of full-time adult workers. This means that 25% of associate degree holders earn more than 68000 annually, and 25% of bachelor's degree holders earn less than 34000 
Our world has changed, and in this new economy, the university degree is no longer the guaranteed path towards financial success as it was for previous generations. And even if you do earn one, that education alone may not be enough. In today's highly technical, knowledge-based economy, having hands-on skills and perfecting what you're good at can be more valuable than getting a degree in something simply to get one. Employers want to know what you can do and what you can do well, not just what degree hangs on your wall. Since new and emerging occupations in every industry now require a combination of academic knowledge and technical ability, we need to ensure that we're also guiding students towards careers and not just to the university. So before enrolling in classes or deciding what you're going to do next in your life, step one is self-exploration. In addition to your interests, really analyze your talents and strengths. Step two is career exploration. Understand the jobs available, the income ranges they pay, and evaluate the skills they require. Identifying an area that appeals to your interests, skills, and the labor market may be your first career. And then you can develop a tentative career plan, complete with multiple training and education options. The key is to align your interests and abilities with your first career choice and the education and training you'll need to receive. This alignment will help bring your future into focus and ensure your position at the top of the pay scale in your chosen career. What all this data shows is that success in the new economy is as much about acquiring the knowledge, skills, and abilities needed for in-demand occupations as it is to be well-educated. Both paths may work for you, but education combined with technical training is how you ultimately secure a competitive advantage in the new economy. Community colleges are in the ideal position to provide over 70% of tomorrow's workforce with an education combined with applied technical skills, industry-driven credentials, and specific preparation for employment. Being a skilled craftsman or technician is highly valued. Investments in career education programs in high schools and community colleges will help all students obtain an education which includes technical training and preparation for the workplace. Ultimately, this is how all students can be successful. In the new economy, both education and technical skills are the new currency. Will you be ready? One, two, seven is really important. So there's some reasons why this talks about uh, people going and getting advanced degrees and things and having a harder time finding jobs and think you're guaranteed a salary. There's a reason why maybe the bachelor's degree is not the safe bet like it used to be. So one is student debt. The Mississippi average is lower than the national debt, uh, which is a good thing, but that's still $26,000. So you know, going straight to get your four-year degree, picking out, that's where you're going to get $26,000. Dropout rate in Mississippi, a state, no miss, for example, uh, the success rate is about 60% graduation. So 40% of people that go there don't even finish. So that's another big reason why it's maybe something to reconsider. Then change of majors. The average college major student changes their major at least three times. I know I did. What about you? You changed yours a few times? Not yet. Not yet. The average done by the time you get into thing. And then of course what we just talked about, one, two, seven. One, two, seven is actually outlined up here. The jobs that are available for high skill, 14, uh, 14%, and there's 25% there to fill them. Middle skill, there's 66% jobs available and only 37% to fill them. And then low skill, there's 19% of the jobs are low skill and 37% of the workforce is there to fill them. So you see your safest bet is going into here, right? I give the example, and that's what the one, two, seven is. Our ratio in Mississippi, like a natural, for every job that requires an advanced degree, there's uh, two jobs, really the one and two is up here, two jobs require a bachelor's degree or less, but seven jobs require an associate's or less. So that's what it means for middle skills, that associate degree, middle. Um, I hear the story all the time, Terry, you said electrical engineering. We have a kid that came through the uh, uh, industrial electrical technology program that's at our building campus. He stayed at home, he, he uh, lived at home, came here. He uh, went to work for a company locally, saved up a lot of money while he was living at home, got a really good you know, $50,000, $60,000 a year job for, with his, industrial, his electrical technology degree. And then now I saved up enough money and transferred to Mississippi State. He's going to electrical engineering at Mississippi State, tr transferred over. That is 
a different path than people just going straight to four year degree and racking up all that debt and all that kind of thing. And so that's what the middle skills gap, and middle skills jobs are all about. Now, if we weren't in a bad enough situation now, if we're in a bad enough situation now, the future is even grimmer. Uh, this is my son Cohen. He's part of Generation Z. Generation Z, 65% of Generation Z will perform jobs that do not even exist yet. And so how do we prepare preparing students for a, a future that we're not even sure of yet? 45% uh, of the activities people are paid to perform today can be automated using current technology. A lot of people think we're in a fourth industrial revolution, uh, that we've gone through mechanization, mass production, even computer automation. There's a lot of robots here around North Mississippi in manufacturing facilities. <clears throat> and then now it's cyber physical systems where things are connected. Talk about here about big data, internet of things, how things are connected. How in the morning your um, coffee maker can turn on based on what you set your alarm on, and your alarm will adjust based on the amount of gases in your car. If it knows you're out of gas and you go by the gas station, all that adjusts automatically. It makes your coffee, it wakes you up earlier. That's the internet of things, of things more connected. Artificial intelligence impacting workforce and changing it. And then of course the robotics is a FANUC robot. ICC is actually a certified FANUC training facility, uh, one of the few in the South to work on these things that build everything from makeup to cars. Uh, FANUC is the market share of FANUC is growing. And it will replace workers on assembly line because they don't call in sick. They work 365 days, 24 hours a day. And they're pretty reliable as far as even breaking down. And we're training people to program them and to work on them. And that's the middle skill. Really, I would say middle skill, but high demand jobs that are in our area. Future of Jobs State predicts that 5 million jobs will be lost for 2020 as AI, robotics, nanotechnology, and other socioeconomic factors replace the need for human workers. The thing that ties together all of this future change. The thing that brings everything really together is computing. Uh, I talked about AI, I talked about big data, I talked about the robots. All of those are controlled by computers. On the industrial side, we call them PLCs, Programmable Logic Controllers. Those are industrial computers. So um, computing technology is a first step for us looking at things. Over a million computer programming and IT related jobs openings by 2024 in the US. But there are only 42,000 computer science degrees awarded in the U.S. last year, according to code.org. I think in Mississippi that number was less than 1,000, which is crazy. That is a hard degree. So what do you do? <clears throat> what you do is you get people to get an associate's degree in computer programming, computer networking, to fill the gap. And that's something that we offer at ICC. The $1,000 median salary in computer programming IT jobs in every industry in every state. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you're looking at 40, 30 to 45, 50 dollars an hour jobs growing at huge clips, 50 percent or more growing and continue to grow as all this automation and things start to start moving its way into our fabric. <coughs> I talked about my son, COVID Generation Z, things that did not exist. Uh, um, there are jobs now that didn't exist five, ten years ago. There's going to be even more jobs as we as computing and stuff advances. But this was I pulled this off of LinkedIn. LinkedIn and two that top skills 2016 LinkedIn Global. LinkedIn's of course where people go to network, to build a portfolio. This is something we did in the Portability Boot Camp. We gave tips on how people do LinkedIn and stuff. And this was the top 10 skills from the jobs posted through LinkedIn. Cloud and distributed computing. Statistical analysis and data mining. Data mining is a huge job that really didn't exist five years ago. Web architecture of course, middleware and integration. User interface design has been around a little while. Of course, network and information security, cybersecurity is a huge thing. Something we've been talking about, maybe starting a program with ICC. Mobile app development, data, search engine optimization, SEO, SEO marketing, storage systems. These are the top 10 skills. And there's not, our marketing program, for example, doesn't go much into data mining. Data mining is something you may need to get a certification for. You need to be an advanced Excel user or database user or access and things like that. People can build their skill sets online, flexible hours with continued education like we offer at ICC um, to add to their skill sets for, to, to be able to be marketable in this new, new uh, economy. How do, so I usually give this talk to teachers and educators, administrators, how do you prepare students for this ever evolving landscape? Um, 21st century skills 
innovation, creativity, digital literacy, project management, adaptability. There's a lot of ways to go about it. I told you one way earlier with a student who got the two year very specific technical skill degrees and then went and branched out to electrical engineering at Mississippi State. But the people who can build the adaptability to keep learning and be lifelong learners are going to probably be some of the most successful. Uh, we have to explore clear opportunities. You have to challenge students with real world assignments, provide internships, ways for people to try things out before they decide a major. I know I'm not doing what my major was until I got in and did student teaching. And I was like, I need to change. And so doing an internship or real world experience is huge for people figuring out what they want to do. The shift from teacher center to student center instruction. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work keys, career readiness credential. Uh, we offer this at ICC. We, we're doing this in some high schools now, and I think more high schools should do it because most people we see are coming back to get a job. A lot of companies are starting to require work keys to, to place you to see where you're a good fit, and people haven't had math in 10 years. And the three sections are applied math, workplace documents, graphic literacy. What the work keys does, you get a bronze, silver, gold, or platinum, or you you may not score high enough if you get a bronze. Bronze is the first level, silver, gold, platinum. If you get a platinum, you can have the skills for almost 99% of jobs that have been profiled by ACT. Bronze is 17%, silver is 69%, and gold, nine, we, we get very few people. We test about 3,000 people a year, and we may get four or five platinum. So, but this goes, it doesn't expire, this goes with people and helps them show how they're adaptable and able to do different things. What should students do? Specialized or adaptable or both? So here is the question. I told you about Tom. Tom was a student who did the electrical technology program at ICC, a very specialized curriculum, very technical, very specific skills. He got a great job before he even graduated, right? But then he's gone out into the world of work and his experience has expanded a little by being out of work. He's not a traditional student any longer that he's worked for a couple of years. Then he decides to go to a four-year school with his engineering degree, his bachelor's, and he's spread now. So this is Tom's path. This cost him less money than most people, right? And he was able to grow as he branched out. Sean is a student I want to talk to you about that I worked with when I worked in Virginia at a liberal arts institution. Very broad, right, degree. Actually, I think his degree was English Lit or something like that. So he's got his bachelor's, very broad. Then he goes into work. He finds a, a consulting or something job like that, starts narrowing down his interest, what he really wants to do, and then goes back and gets a master's degree in a very specialized skill set. His journey was very different, probably more front-loaded with cost at a four-year institution, a liberal arts institution, but he's also adaptable. He's done some amazing things. He helped start the Consumer Protection Financial Bureau. He's done all kinds of really cool things that worked all around the country, coast to coast. So there's no one right answer, but there's different ways to go about it. But at the end of the day, it's going to be specialized skills. And I put a copy of Sean's resume. Now, this is this is a technical. This is a uh, uh, I don't know what you would call this it's digital resume. Um, and you see here the companies he worked for and how he outlined it. And then you see here and you see his you know degrees and, and things that student leadership things he's been involved in. But then you see the technical skills, Django, Python. You see, these are things he got after school, but he got specific technical. So you see a really broad, you see these really great things he's done and worked for and the timeline of it, but then you see also the technical availability. And that's what Steve Jobs, you can barely see here, but I always say that Apple was a great marriage of liberal arts and technology. That you had those two coming together to create what Apple was all about, the creativity and the specific uh, skills through technology. And specific skills pays more. You see here that someone who got a liberal arts degree, they went and got an IT for networking uh, certification, thousand more dollars, but they'd, be, they'd go for almost 70,000 more uh, jobs that are available. General business, 70,000, 500,000 more jobs. Data management, 130,000 more jobs, and a 12 grand premium. That's a huge bump. Computer credit program was 20,000 bob from someone who just had a general uh, liberal arts degree. Uh, the most valuable new degrees will provide a mix of academic disciplines, workplace experiences, 
and hands-on projects. I've given you two examples of how those are different. There's some cool things going on in our area even. Um, the Imagine the Possibilities Career Expo is for eighth graders. It's an amazing thing. Seven to the 8,000 eighth graders come through to see all this technology and jobs in our area. It happens over the Bank Corp South Arena. That's put on by Create. It's an amazing event for Toyota. This is our Take a Go camp for kids. We do a manufacturing camp where kids come in and actually make this clock. They come in and make a clock and it's, um, they, get, they go tour facilities. They get to check that out. This is a program for students who just graduated high school. It's in Water Valley. It's called Base Camp Coding Academy. They took 15 or 16 students that were recommended by their counselors and principals and teachers that weren't sure about college but wanted to try something. They, they went for one year every day, 8 to 5 p.m., doing coding over in Water Valley, Mississippi. And every one of these students have got a job offered by Ceasefire and FedEx, I think. And you can see all their portfolios online at Basecamp Coding Academy. And then, of course, we're doing some pretty innovative stuff at ICC. We have an advanced manufacturing internship with Toyota. We're starting a new non-registered apprenticeship program called Careers in Advanced Manufacturing Technology with Computing and Industrial Maintenance Local Technology Area. And we have 12 companies signed up to host almost 30 students, where they come to school two days a week and they go to work three days a week. So they get real world experience right from their, even their freshman year. Um, another thing that a lot of people talk about is instilling entrepreneurship. The gig economy is a huge thing right now. 9.2 million are working on demand jobs with digital platforms. A lot of self-employed people creating their own job. Entrepreneurial thinking is not just for business students. Uh, it's being incorporated into a lot of different things. We at ICC are trying to do that. We're doing a lot of leadership development too. Strengths Finder is something we did at the Employability Boot Camp. We do it in that magazine. There's some first time supervisor trainings. We do that to help people find their role and, and what they're good at. And that's a key to figuring out what you kind of want to do with your life sometimes. And that's all I got. Any questions? Uh, you know, how would we get more people to an event like this? To this? Yeah. Uh, oh man, I don't know. Uh, you know, for us, we try to uh, make things as um, many partnerships as we can. So uh, we had three or four other organizations involved. Um, anything you do in a community, the more community partners you have, the more it's out in the community. So, uh, you know, finding the right partners, finding uh, companies who want to promote computer science, um, like CSA or sort of Cadence, finding those companies that uh, have a vested interest in creating people to do that. I think the more partners, the better. Yeah. Time of day, I don't know what your target audience is. You know, a lot of people are working right now. Um, maybe it should be something that's you know, five to nine o'clock, like a night class uh, or a weekend Saturday thing. Just have to think about. Um, yeah, I was shocked when the employability boot came out. Staff thought I was crazy doing a Saturday, Sunday. But our biggest turnout was Sunday. Uh, I was shocked that the biggest turnout was Sunday. Was church around here. We didn't do it until 1 o'clock after church. Uh, but yeah, engage as many people as you can. Uh, form a committee of those people and have this committee help guide what's going to be a part of that. Yeah, we had multiple meetings with probably 10 or 12 people sitting around the table to decide, you know, what everything should be. And that's... The more people you get involved, the more people are getting excited about stuff. So that's yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool, man.